any time that they're waking for more than 20 minutes and you can't resettle them, you've got a bit of a problem. Because most babies, um, if you think about the three-month-olds, even though they're waking up to breastfeed during the night, they're going to go right back to sleep fairly quickly. But if it's taking 20 minutes to settle them after a breastfeed, then you need to be saying, okay, what's going on here? Um, for the more than two times a night, if you think about it, breastfeeders are going to feed on average about every three hours. So they're, they're probably going to feed, um, say you fed them at eight, because you're getting them ready for, well, say seven, you're getting them ready for sleep, because um, they really, you shouldn't probably be keeping these six month olds up till eight. So you feed them at seven, maybe they're down to sleep by 7.30. So then you're probably going to have to have another feed at around 10. And then, but you wouldn't consider that night yet because usually the parents haven't gone to sleep. So then you're probably going to end up with another feed at around two and then another feed at around five. So that's about two times per night. So what I'm finding is happening is these kids aren't waking up to breastfeed. They're waking up when they come up into these light sleep states. And because the parents can't figure out any other way to get them to sleep but to feed them, they breastfeed them back to sleep. And they will go back to sleep on the breast. But then you've got the problem of getting them off the breast and sliding them onto the sleep surface and crawling out of the room and hoping that they, you know, don't wake up again. So I, I want to be really clear that it, in no way did any of the interventions we're suggesting interfere with breastfeeding. And in no way am I, we trying to undermine breastfeeding because we understand that it's a very important thing that babies do and they need to do it for as long as their moms can manage to do it. But there are ways to combine sleep and breastfeeding without undermining sleep or undermining breastfeeding, and that's what we're trying to do. And my suspicion is that a lot of women give up breastfeeding early, at around six months, because they're exhausted, and they attribute the night waking to the breastfeeding, and they're just not prepared to do it anymore. So actually, by dealing with some of these underlying sleep problems, there's the potential for us to increase the length of time that women are breastfeeding their babies without having to deal with sleep deprivation. So um, the children require parental presence to go to sleep. That's a negative sleep association. And there's been lots and lots of studies, I cite some of them here, of lots of big, big numbers of kids. So Mindell did a study uh, with the National Sleep Foundation in the US, and she had 1,500 kids in her sample. And the SATA um, study that I cite, they got parents to respond online to questionnaires and there were 5,000 parents from US and Canada who responded online to talk about their, to fill out this questionnaire on their kids sleep problems. Yeah, 5,000. Um, so um, obviously they, they, there are um, cautions associated with this research because they are based, it is based on parental report. It's not based on what we call objective sleep measures. And so for the randomized tr controlled trial we're doing in Vancouver, we do have parental report or sleep diaries, but we're also putting actographs on the babies. And my husband calls it leg waving. So we have this little wristwatch like thing that we put on the baby's ankle. And if they wave their legs at night like this, sorry, you can't pick that up on the video, um, then the actograph detects motion. It's an accelerometer and it says that baby's awake. But if they're not waving their legs at night, the baby's asleep. And what we do is we get this raw actigraphy data from the babies wearing it for five nights in a row, and we apply an algorithm to it through a computer program. And then we have a readout of what's going on with the sleep, sleep efficiency, wake time, longest sleep time, longest wake time, et cetera. So it's an objective measure of sleep. Now, what I have found in the uh, pilot study I did was that the actigraphy and the parent's sleep diaries actually agreed with each other quite well when the babies were signaling. So if there's signaling going on, which is the crying, you get like an 80% agreement between the atigraphy and the sleep diaries. Where you don't get the 80% agreement is after the babies stop signaling. So they come up into the light sleep state, they wake up for a little while, but then they go back down to sleep and they don't signal. That's when the, there, there starts to be less agreement between the parental diaries and what's going on with the babies. So I think when the babies are signaling, these parental reports are actually quite an accurate measure of what's happening with the kids' sleep. So SADE et al. had 5,000 people in their sample, and what they showed was it increased the risk of uh, night waking and difficulty settling if you've got these negative on sleep onset associations. So children require parental presence to fall asleep. And 
this was the case. Um, there was a study that was done later. I'm just looking for that one on my notes. And parental presence at bedtime was not only associated with 1.7 hours less sleep for infants, but also school-aged children were six times more likely to wake at night if parents were present when they fell asleep. So this is older kids. This is school-aged kids. So this parental presence at sleep is not, um, what's the word I'm looking for? It, it's not totally innocuous, and it, it's implicated in sleep problems well beyond the infancy period. Infants share a bedroom with their parents. Now, in some cases, parents can't help sharing a bedroom with their infants. Uh, I live in Vancouver. In Vancouver, houses cost millions of dollars. A lot of parents are living in one-bedroom apartments with their neonates and their, and their one-year-olds, and everybody sleeps in the same bedroom because there isn't really an option. They can't afford to have a two-bedroom place. You can figure out ways of getting around that, but in an ideal world, it's easier to help kids uh, regulate their sleep patterns if they're not sharing the same bedroom with their parents. And often this is the case with what I call light sleepers. I'll often ask parents if their children are light sleepers, and often these kids are. And we don't realize how much noise we make when we're sleeping at night, because we're sleeping. But we snort. We sometimes snore. Um, sometimes we might even talk in our sleep. And if you've got a baby that's occupying a room with parents who's a light sleeper, that kind of thing is going to wake them up. And that, then it's not always easy for them to get back down into their sleep cycle again. So what I'll suggest for parents who have no option but to room share with babies is to use what we call white noise. And you can buy machines that actually generate white noise. Or if you want to not go there, you can go buy yourself a little radio and keep it off the station on hiss and put it in the room so that it creates white noise and covers the background noise so that there's less risk of waking up the babies at night or children at night. Children who are breastfed to sleep or given a bottle to sleep during the night have a higher incidence of night waking. Now this is not precluding breastfeeding at night. This is talking about breastfeeding them to sleep for naps and breastfeeding to them to sleep when you settle them for the night. So what I, um, so I'll come back to this because what I, I recommend that parents take a certain approach to this in order to try and diminish the number of kids who are waking up at night. Children brought into their parents' beds are going to have more problems with night waking. And the study that was done um, by Sade et al. and Mindell found that um, more than 50% of infants and toddlers were put to bed asleep and infants put to bed asleep were twice as likely to wake at night, with 80% of parents reporting night waking most nights of the week, and they're getting one hour less of sleep a night. And um, there, it's very clear that uh, bringing them into bed with them does diminish um, their sleep time because they're waking at night more frequently. Uh, and I saw a study, uh, I haven't, they haven't published it yet, unfortunately, but when I, it is, I'll, I'll let people know about it if they want to know. It was, we, we gave a symposium with our cortisol paper at uh, the infant uh, behavioral conference, um, and there, there was a symposium with all of the papers on cortisol and sleep, and people had looked at babies that co-slept with their parents compared to babies that didn't, and the babies who were co-sleeping with their parents had higher cortisol levels than the babies who didn't co-sleep. So there's something about co-sleeping that seems to be an arousal, seems to create a state of arousal in babies, and that may be kind of re, um, preventing them resetting their cortisol levels during the night. It's very preliminary work, but I think it's important that we continue to pursue this and look at kind of what's going on here.